Uh, so what I'm going to do today is uh, focus on our work on first row metal uh, catalyst for CH functionalization. So thanks for uh, the invitation to speak to the center and to the uh, virtual audience. So we have the next slide. So how we entered this area is uh, focused on this very powerful reaction of uh, iridium catalyzed CH borylation. And uh, this is a reaction, as many of you know, was developed uh, by Mitch Smith, John Hartwig, and, and others that uh, is by and large selective for sp2 ch bonds uh, and typically with iridium catalysts so if we can go to the animation uh, and, and what's really remarkable about this chemistry is not only the products and the value of the uh, organoboron products that are formed but also the incredibly powerful and predictable site selectivity of the reaction so that any sterically accessible ch bond will undergo ch uh, borylation and the mechanism for this if we can have the next animation uh, is, I think, pretty generally agreed upon. Uh, it looks a little unusual, I think, to organometallic chemists when you first look at it, because it's an iridium 3-5 uh, cycle. So the two electron chemistry is not at all uh, surprising, but in fact, the redox couple is. And uh, I wanna draw your attention going from uh, 12 o'clock to about four o'clock, and the oxidative addition of the CH bond from iridium 3 at this tris boril species, that's believed to be the slow step in the reaction to actually uh, break the aryl CH bond and then to undergo subsequent functionalization. And it's that part of the catalytic cycle that, that we focused on when we tried to think about doing this kind of chemistry with first row transition metals. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so here are some general goals of our CH functionalization uh, project. We all know that iridium, rhodium, some of the metals uh, at the bottom of the periodic table are expensive. It would be nice, of course, to do this with iron or cobalt for those reasons. But really the driver here is, is trying to do complementary chemistry. So try to overcome some of the limitations that uh, have been observed with the precious metals. And so substrates that are electron rich uh, have been problematic for, for iridium catalyzed borylation. And as I'll show you, uh, fluorinated aromatics, uh, the selectivity has been quite poor uh, and actually quite predictable with the iridium compounds because of the, of the steric uh, site selectivity. And then what this has led us to, and I'll, I'll allude to this at the end, is, is more of a grand challenge. And, and in listening to Hugh in Australia, I heard about uh, his group's progress on, on some of these same issues. And that is, uh, as Justin alluded to in the last talk, can you use uh, catalyst control site selectivity to take a molecule that looks simple like ethyl benzene and have different catalysts to selectively functionalize each one of the CH bonds. And at the end, I'll show you some of the progress we've made, made, we've made there. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, so here's an, an overview of the kinds of uh, compounds that we've been working with in my lab uh, with respect to iron and how we got into this CH functionalization chemistry. So the, the goal for us has been trying to enable two electron chemistry with these first row transition metals that often have kinetically and thermodynamically accessible one electron states to them. And so we've come up with these rather elaborate strategies shown on the left of, of having metal ligand cooperativity, these so-called redox active ligands where you have a radical character on the supporting conjugated pi system of the ligand. Unfortunately, when you do that, what you're doing is you're pulling electron density off the metal. And so if you try, for example, to do a simple oxidative addition reaction of dihydrogen, and in fact doesn't happen, and, and you get stuck, for example, at these iron dihydrogen complexes. And so this iron two oxidation state is maintained throughout the reaction and kind of tells you that we've done the, the redox control almost too good, that we're, we're stuck at iron two. And so what we did is uh, we replaced uh, the donor, the imine donors with n-heterocyclic carbenes. And so uh, a graduate student at the time, uh, John Darman, and then followed by uh, Pony Yu in my lab, had taken this compound, a derivative that was previously prepared by Andreas Tanopoulos. And we were able to show that this compound, being more electron rich in iron, underwent oxidative addition uh, of dihydrogen to give you this uh, dihydride dihydrogen complex uh, shown on the slide. And so if we can have the next animation, uh, what was uh, remarkable here is that in the course of studying olefin hydrogenation, we found that uh, if you expose something like uh, an aromatic hydrocarbon like toluene to deuterium in the presence of this iron compound, there was HC exchange. And this was really a, a huge breakthrough for our lab. Uh, I call it the, the, the world's simplest CH functionalization. All we're doing is exchanging hydrogen for deuterium, but nevertheless, it was, it was profoundly important for our thinking uh, of how these metals are operating. So if you can add the next uh, animation, what we saw were two really important observations. The, the first is that the reaction was site selective, much like there's iridium borylation catalyst. So the only positions that were deuterated in toluene were the meta and para positions. So the ones away from the methyl group. 
And more importantly, for the application I'm going to show you, the reaction was uh, more rapid, more effective, the lower the pressure of deuterium gas that you use. So a little counterintuitive at first. So the lower pressure gas, the more HD exchange. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we entered a collaboration. Oh, sorry, here's the mechanism first before I tell you what the utility is. So to combine these concepts, what we think is going on is this formerly iron zero compound uh, oxidatively adds dihydrogen to go down to the lower uh, left part of the screen. And then as you do, you uh, sit at the iron dihydride, we think that does oxidative addition. We don't know if that's an iron uh, two, iron four process or somehow an iron two, iron two process. And then you do reductive elimination of the CD bond uh, to give you the observed product. And uh, one of the things that we think is the origin of the uh, deuterium inhibition is if you add the animation, is that you end up off at this resting state, off cycle resting state where you have this dihydride, uh, dihydrogen complex or dideuteride dideuterium complex that uh, inhibits the catalyst from binding the arene substrate. And so the application for this, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, was, in, was uh, identified in collaboration with Merck. They're only about 45 minutes from here. And uh, what is uh, useful in this chemistry is the ability to introduce tritium in the form of T2 gas into uh, uh, advanced um, intermediates in the pharmaceutical industry are actually the, the actual final drug. And so I show on this slide the, the timeline to bring a drug to market. And it's this intermediate stage of these ADME studies uh, determining the, the drug efficacy and its safety that where this really comes into play. And so I show uh, this recent uh, drug that came onto market from Merck where they were able to label it both with C14 and uh, tritium. And this is the, these molecules are, are fed to animal models to determine uh, their fate in, in the organism. And so the name of the game here is not catalyst cost. No one cares about that. Uh, it's, it's site selectivity. And really the most important thing is uh, using as low a pressure as tritium gas as, as humanly possible because you don't want to deal with a lot of radioactive waste. And so if you go forward to the next slide, the state of the art in this field is Crabtree's catalyst. And what this does is directed HD exchange. And so this uh, benzamide substrate really uh, highlights the orthogonality between the iron and the iridium chemistry. So with uh, iridium, you get orthoselective uh, HD exchange at four atmospheres of deuterium. Uh, if you add the animation, With the iron catalyst, you can see it's completely complementary. So you don't see, use the directing group at all. And in fact, what we see now is uh, meta para selectivity uh, exclusively. So low catalyst loadings, low deuterium pressures, this works quite well. So if we go to the next slide, we're able to apply this now in collaboration with Merck to tritiation of real pharmaceuticals. And this is very predictable. So all you have to do is look for sterically accessible CH bonds. So bonds that um, are next to a fluorine atom or smaller, basically a hydrogen. And so in this Roche uh, drug, we, we carried out the tritiation. And uh, we see a little bit of some uh, tritiation. And this is the beauty of using tritium NMR. It's, it's the most sensitive nucleus on the periodic table. Uh, you can see some trace tritiation even in sp3 position of that, uh, of that ester. But, but by and large, the tritiation is at the uh, site ortho to the, to the fluorine. Whereas uh, in this specific molecule, the iridium catalyst doesn't work because there's no directing group for the catalyst to grab onto to introduce the substrate to the molecule. And if we have the next animation, I'll show you one more example. Oh, I've got cut here. Hopefully you can see it on the screen. Uh, it's this Amgen drug. And uh, oops, it's, it's, it's there on the bottom of the screen. So you can see that the uh, sterically accessible positions on the, uh, on the molecule are tritiated with the iron catalyst. And then the iridium compound does directed CH functionalization through that amino group uh, to give you tritiation at a certain site. So again, highlighting the complementarity of the two, of the two catalysts. So, so with that in hand now, we wanted to go ahead and think about, if you go to the next slide, methods uh, to go back to this borelation problem. So we now think we have control over electronic structure and enabling two electron uh, CH bond breaking at a first row metal. And one of the questions we asked was, why do these iridium compounds go through this 3-5 cycle? Only one of the boreal ligands ends up in your product where two are spectator ligands in the catalytic cycle. And so what we thought was maybe you could prepare a cobalt compound, if I can have the animation, with a single boreal ligand that would be active for the CH functionalization. And we chose this uh, phosphine uh, pyridine pincer ligand because, uh, as shown in the middle of the slide, we knew that we could do two electron oxidative addition chemistry. So this uh, pincer compound of cobalt behaves very much like Vasquez compound uh, with iridium doing two electron oxidative addition. Okay, so our task was to try to prepare this cobalt-1 boreal, 
And if you uh, go to the next slide, Jenny Abogacian uh, did this. And so what she was able to show was you could take this cobalt-1 methyl compound, treat it with uh, B2-PIN2, and very cleanly make uh, the cobalt-1 Borel species. And when you crystallographically characterize the molecule as shown on the slide, it coordinates uh, a molecule of dinitrogen. Uh, Donna was talking earlier in her talk about uh, having fits with reviewers. That little N2 molecule caused us a lot of concern with one of the reviewers in this paper. So it's funny we got caught up in. Uh, go to the next uh, animation, please. It has absolutely nothing to do with catalysis, if you're, <laughs> if you're worried. It's just a molecule of crystallization, if you will. And, and the, the real exciting breakthrough here was to just take this uh, cobalt-1 beryl, and you dissolve it in benzene, and what you see is a single turnover to generate uh, the borelated airing product along with a cobalt hydride that's unstable and, and goes off and decomposes. So now we have the components, we think, for a, a nice uh, cobalt correlation catalyst. So if we go to the next slide, that's indeed the case. And so we've shown both with uh, HB pin and B2 pin 2, these cobalt pincer compounds are quite active for correlation of, of both arenes and heteroarenes. And with <coughs> substrates with acidic CH bonds like benzofuran, you can get very high turnover numbers of up to 5,000. And so we published that, and so I won't spend a lot of time on it. You can, you can read about it if you are, are so interested. But what I want to turn your attention to now is trying to come up with uh, catalytic uh, examples of where some of the chemistry of cobalt is orthogonal to iridium, much like we did in the tritiation chemistry. So if you can uh, show the animation. Uh, one of the problems that, that Jenny uh, focused on were, was a selective correlation of fluorinated arenes. And, and you can see uh, in these two pharmaceutical products and this um, agrochemical, you can see connections ortho to fluorine and, and arenes is a common motif. And so it would be nice through suzuki Miura coupling to prepare uh, these correlated arenes uh, to then use in the cross-coupling reaction to prepare motifs like this. So if you go ahead uh, to the next slide, the, this compares, uh, I think, very nicely the uh, function of the iridium uh, Hartwig-Smith uh, catalyst to the cobalt one. And, and the, the beauty of the Hartwig-Smith catalyst is that it's really active and it's highly predictable. And so this molecule, this iridium compound, and this is a great lesson in catalysis, you don't just want to make the most active catalyst as you can, because this iridium compound goes after just about every sterically accessible CH bond in this uh, simple bi fluoral biphenyl molecule. And so you get mixtures of products, again, that are under steric, uh, steric control. And if you let the reaction run long enough, you start borrelating both of the airing rings in the substrate. The cobalt compound tends to be a little bit less, little less active, and that, that goes uh, to our advantage here. And so what you see is a very nice uh, mixture of uh, borelated products. And, and the major one, and 94% yield, is the one that's uh, borelated ortho to fluorine. And so what this is telling you is, is that the cobalt uh, catalyst is able to differentiate the acidity of those CH bonds. And it's going to be selected now for the most acidic CH bond in the molecule. And we think this is a distinct advantage over iridium catalyst. So if you go to the next slide, I can show you another example of this. Uh, so uh, Hartwig has um, very cleverly developed these directing groups. And so you can use uh, silane directing groups in iridium catalyzed borelation to overcome this site selectivity and end up with not ortho to boron, boron selectivity in the iridium case, but in fact, uh, ortho to the directing group, much like what we saw with Crabtree's catalyst in the, in the HD exchange chemistry. But with cobalt, the directing group uh, doesn't really seem to matter here. And so what you do is uh, you go back into the world of this electronic control. And so the major product of the reaction, again, is the, the borrelation of the most acidic CH bond, and you get a 91% uh, ratio of ortho to fluorine borrelation. So we, we think this is really exciting. So if you go ahead to the next slide, uh, this, this may look like a bit of an esoteric substrate, but uh, I'm very proud of this result. I had very little to do with it. This is uh, Jenny's uh, work again. Uh, you can take this uh, fluorinated uh, aryl ester, and uh, what you see with iridium again is uh, sterically controlled CH bond selectivity. With cobalt, uh, we, if you can go to the animation, we, uh, that was my uptick in my voice, Dan, to get you to click the button. Um, <laughs> do that. <laughs> so uh, we, we can electronically differentiate the CH bonds, and we get again very high. Uh, ortho to fluorine selectivity. And the reason why we picked this substrate is if uh, you go to the animation, this maps very nicely onto one of those uh, molecules I showed at the beginning of this uh, section of the talk, fluorbuprofen. And so now this 
fluorylation enables a, a streamlined synthesis of that molecule in just a few steps, again, enabled by the cobalt catalyzed CH fluorylation. So uh, this was a momentous uh, achievement in my laboratory. This is the first total synthesis uh, ever conducted <laughs> by my group. So a uh, very proud moment. Stop laughing, people at Princeton. <laughs> okay, we can go to the next slide. And they're laughing around the world, I'm sure. Um, so, so what I want to uh, finish with is how these catalysts operate. And so we went ahead and, uh, as, as Donna uh, very aptly described, we did the kinetics last. And uh, we went <laughs> and uh, established the uh, rate law for the reaction. So what we're going to do here is uh, use 2,6-lutidine as our model substrate. Uh, simply because it gives us a single product and, and obeys uh, very nice, clean uh, reaction uh, conditions. And so what we learned uh, very quickly is that the reaction is first order with uh, respect to cobalt and to uh, the substrate, and a primary kinetic isotope effect of around 3 and 80 degrees. So this all points to uh, CH uh, activation, CH bond breaking as the turnover limiting step in the catalytic cycle. So if we can have the next uh, animation, uh, and not, how about the next one? And so we, we went ahead and studied, and one of the questions that uh, I frequently was asked when presenting this chemistry, does the catalyst borelate itself? And uh, I said, of course not. And then we actually went and did the experiment, and we found out that the catalyst borelates itself faster than it borelates the substrate. And so, in fact, with this original catalyst as shown with the hydrogen in the para position of the pincer, uh, it turns out that's not, in fact, the active catalyst at all for lutidine borelation. What is, is the para boril substituted catalyst. And this really raises now all kinds of concerns because what is the role of that boril group on the electronic properties of the cobalt? And so at very short times, you see the cobalt one as the resting state at longer reaction times as the uh, catalysis gets going, you start to now make cobalt three uh, dihydride boril as your catalyst resting state and the crystal structure of the molecule is shown there. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we wanted to improve catalyst performance and so uh, we're really, again, concerned about the presence of that uh, boril group uh, on the catalyst. And so if you, if you add the animation, Jenny prepared a, a series of these compounds. And what we found, and, and was probably most, uh, so, you know, a bit concerning, was that that uh, four boril substituted catalyst was, in fact, the slowest. So the boril uh, substituent being electron withdrawing really does slow down that oxidative addition step that we believe is turnover limiting. And so Jenny came up with various strategies on how to prevent that. You can uh, uh, dimethylate the, the meta positions of the pyridine to try to prevent the borelation that improves your catalyst, catalyst activity. You can simply put a methyl group uh, in the para position, or if you want to be a little bit more sophisticated, you can put the 4 uh, proledoneal substituent in there. And this is a nice, again, lesson in catalyst trade-off. If you don't mind stirring your reactions a little bit longer, the, the 4-methyl catalyst is going to be the preferred one. And if you're an astute observer, you would have seen uh, that abbreviation on some of our slides. So. There's a nice trade-off between synthetic ease of uh, accessibility of the catalyst versus uh, its activity. So you just take a little bit of a hit on turnover frequency, um, but you can make uh, the catalyst and the ligand much more easily and in fewer steps. So if you go ahead uh, to the next slide, uh, our, our mechanism we believe that that's operative uh, in this chemistry is not iridium-3,5 or cobalt-3,5. It's in fact, uh, we think cobalt-1,3, so a, a distinction between the iridium and the cobalt. Uh, much like iridium, though, we believe that breaking the CH bond is indeed turnover limiting. So to go from cobalt-1 to cobalt-3. Uh, and then, whoops, we can go back. We're not ready for that yet. Uh, we then do a reductive elimination of the uh, aryl B-pin product to give you a cobalt hydride. And then this can oxidatively add if you're using b 2 pin 2 as your uh, borylating reagent uh, to give you a diboryl uh, hydride, which then eliminates HB-pin, which is a stoichiometric byproduct of the reaction to regenerate cobalt-1 and go around the site. Okay, so now if we can go to the next slide, I want to tie together uh, some of the concepts that uh, we've, we've talked about so far. And so the, the question is, can we go away from sp2 selectivity? So I think we have uh, a very nice catalyst system that was based on fundamental principles of, of electron flow that mimics iridium with some key differences, right? The key difference being electronic uh, selectivity over steric selectivity and, and fluorinated arenes, but the mechanism of the reaction and, and overall the performance of the catalyst does do a lot of the same things that, are, that iridium, uh, you know, BIPI catalysts do. And so the question is, how do you get out in a, in a substrate like uh, ethyl benzene to those sp3 sites? And so one of the things we thought about was, could we go back to redox active ligands, maybe a bidentate ligand? And if you uh, look 
at uh, the iridium catalyst shown in the middle top of the slide versus the cobalt compound that I'm drawing as a target, you can see, I think, some of the structural similarities of such a, a cobalt compound would form that you could have, say, for example, a simple alpha diamine ligand on cobalt that would be easy to prepare, that would be similar, for example, to the well-known uh, bipyridine ligands used in iridium catalysis. So Neil Palmer in my lab prepared one of these compounds. Uh, our initial synthetic entry point into this uh, were these cobalt dialkyls. So these are cobalt two compounds, they're paramagnetic. Uh, they're a little bit tricky to uh, characterize if you're not used to dealing with these things, but uh, EPR spectroscopy, as you imagine, uh, is, is quite useful here. If you don't like air sensitive molecules, uh, you can replace the alkyl ligands with carboxylates, pivlates, uh, for example and you'll end up with very nice air-stable, bench-stable catalyst precursors. Okay, so with these cobalt compounds in hand, now we can uh, examine their catalytic performance. And if we go ahead to the next slide, uh, what we found, if you look at a simple reaction like the borylation of toluene, so remember, most uh, precious metal and, and our previous cobalt compound will be selective for the sp2 sites in this molecule. What we're pleased to find is that now with this redox-active alpha diamine ligand, this cobalt compound now promotes the selective borylation of the sp3 sites with no evidence for sp2 uh, CH borylation. And there's a, an interesting uh, observation that accompanied uh, this discovery, and that is we don't make the monoborylated product. In fact, what we observed uh, routinely in, in this chemistry were diborylated products. And so what that led us to, to, to find is that the boril group, and I don't think this is widely appreciated in the CH functionalization literature, serves as an activating group for the other CH bonds in the methyl group. So once you put one boril ligand on the toluene, then the remaining two CH bonds become even more activated for subsequent uh, CH borylation. So if you uh, go to the animation now, we have a small substrate table here uh, showing you some of the various uh, functional groups that are uh, tolerated by the reaction. I think uh, two of the most interesting are the sp2. Uh, borylated arene. So now you have molecules where you have uh, reactive B pin substituents either in the sp3 sites or in the sp2 sites. And so you can see one of the challenges here is that uh, our catalyst loadings sometimes uh, are high and uh, our reaction times are long, temperatures are high. So this is a, a new discovery for us and we're still contending with uh, improving the catalyst uh, performance in itself. So if we have the next animation. Uh, this is kind of fun. So with xylene, and to reinforce this concept of the activating group of the, uh, of the activating effect of the B-pin substituent, uh, if, you do, if you carry out the borylation of paraxylene, what you see is if you run the reaction at uh, relatively short reaction times, you see diborylation of one methyl group. And then if you really uh, hammer on the reaction for a little bit more, you then see the remaining methyl group undergo the diborylation. So again, highlighting that you don't see statistical mixtures, you see uh, one methyl group undergo diborylation, and then the next methyl group undergo diborylation again. So if we go to the next slide, uh, here are some, I just think, really pretty crystal structures uh, of some of these diborylated products. Uh, it, there's the uh, paraxylene isomer and the orthoxylene isomer. So no, nothing uh, structurally unusual here, just really pretty uh, molecules to look at. Uh, if you go ahead, and, and it just uh, warms my heart to have a crystal structure without a metal in it. Uh, okay. So, um, so to, to, to wrap this up, one, one might ask, what's the why the difference in selectivity? So we have two classes now of, of cobalt compounds that uh, are promoting CH borylation, but one is selective for sp2 sites in a more traditional sense, and then these newer compounds that are uh, selective for the sp3 sites. So uh, I hope hopefully convinced you that in the pincer cases, in the cobalt one case, we've been able to establish this what we call precious metal-like reactivity from the two electron oxidative addition to give you uh, sp2 selectivity based on everything that we know in organometallic chemistry for sp2 over sp3 CH oxidative addition. Uh, if we have the animation, when we go to the redox active compounds, our thinking now, and this is uh, really proof of a concept by ChemDraw, so we don't have a lot of uh, experimental evidence for this, but it really looks pretty on the, on the slide, is uh, what we think we're making uh, perhaps is a diboryl cobalt 2. And uh, we believe, we think that uh, this is maybe radical chemistry. And so what you do is a, a CH abstraction from the sp3 site. So you break the weakest CH bond in the molecule by this uh, diboryl compound. And if you carry out a DFT calculation on that species, what you find is that you get 
uh, two redox active ligands in the molecule, one in the alpha diimine, which is not surprising, but the other one is, is that that B2 pin2 ligand on the cobalt actually has significant radical anion character. So we think that that could be the reason why we're doing this H atom abstraction chemistry, if that's indeed the case, uh, on toluene for the sp3 site. And you can do a calculation with my colleague uh, Rob Knowles, his group helped us with this. Then you can show that as you install one B pin group onto a methyl group, you plummet the CH bond strength of the remaining. Uh, CH bonds in the molecule by about seven kcals, and that explains the, uh, the subsequent uh, more reactive borylation and diboron products that we observe in this chemistry. Okay, so if we can go to the final slide. I think it's the final slide. No, it's not the final slide. Um, so one of the things that we think is really interesting here is that uh, we've developed uh, some uh, related catalysts for hydroboration of alkenes, and one of the, the key findings in that result was that, in those results, but that the cobalt catalysts like to make carbon boron bonds at primary carbons. And so no matter where this, the uh, olefin started in your substrate, you ended up with a chain running process that put the CV bond at the end of the chain. And what we're hoping is to harness this now in uh, CH functionalization chemistry. So if we can have the animation. Uh, we observe this is, in fact, the case. So again, the catalyst loadings are high. The conditions are a bit forcing. But if you look at something simple like isopropyl uh, benzene, you can see that you get, uh, we think, and we know from some deuteration studies that the initial CH activation occurs at the benzylic position, but then the cobalt uh, runs the boron out to the, uh, to the methyl group and uh, gives you the, the observed product. Now you might say, well, why would you, why would you want to make this? I mean, Dubois sitting at his desk and he would make that by hydroboration of alpha methyl styrene and I wouldn't blame him for doing that. But if you go to the, uh, always got to insult the audience somewhere on a slide. <laughs> Uh, if you go to the next animation, uh, these products would be a little bit harder to make by hydroboration. So if you run these at very long times and very high catalyst loadings, you can now make these uh, diborylated products that, again, would be uh, difficult to make in other ways. And this uh, relatively unactivated remote SP3CH bond that we believe uh, is accessed by first initial CH bond activation at the benzylic position and then followed by chain running out to the primary carbon to form the CB bonds. So, so we think this is a really uh, nice new frontier that we're currently exploring uh, in our lab. So if we go ahead to the, to the next slide, that's the conclusion. So you can just run through the animation stand. Um, so this just reiterates just some of the highlights uh, that we observed today. And, and Hugh, you know, I know you're gonna be disappointed. So uh, this is, go ahead to the, you can go to the acknowledgements. Um, this is a joke I told in, in Australia and Justin, you set me up beautifully. Um, so the, your center has a, a vast uh, array of uh, people from around the country and all kinds of collaborators. And so I refer to them as the, the Jedi Council of very smart people studying selective CH bond functionalization. Um, and uh, these two folks are very talented chemists, but uh, if you're a Star Wars fan, um, I, you, know, you learn that dark Sith Lords always come in pairs. And uh, so there are my pairs of Sith Lords that are uh, taking on the Jedi Council of uh, Selective CH Bond Functionalization. So uh, with that, uh, I think it's time to conclude before I, I get really in trouble. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions in uh, any way you want to ask. So, so thank you.